Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's very special lecture, which is a lecture in honour and memory of the late and great Harry Evans, former Clerk of the Senate. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Canberra region and to pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. I'd like to acknowledge the presence here today of members of Harry's family, of Senate staff, present and past, other parliamentary staff, present and past. I'd like to say hello to my new friends from U3A in the Belconnen group, who, who I um, liberally distributed flyers amongst uh, the, recently. And I'd like to also um, say welcome to all of you who have come out today to hear this lecture. This is the second of our, our Harry Evans lectures. We decided that, that it would be a fitting tribute to him to have um, a lecture each year in his honour. Last year, the inaugural lecture was delivered by Michael Macklin, a former Australian Democrat senator. And for that purpose, we produced a, a little booklet of, of, um, of vignettes and, and recollections of Harry, which you will find on your seat uh, today, because we had lots of them printed so that we could continue to distribute them over the future years. Well, I think Harry would be thrilled today to Sorry. To have Anne Toomey here to give this year's lecture, because Anne, I think, was a bit of a favourite of Harry's, and um, he would be proud of the fact that she has has uh, served in um, many different different uh, ways, but covering chapters one, two, and three of the Constitution. Um, starting out as, as a researcher with the High Court and moved to the Parliamentary Research Service here. And um, I then nabbed her and recruited her as the Secretary of our Legal and Constitutional Committee, which she did with great aplomb. And, um, but for all too short a time, and uh, from there she went to the Cabinet Office in New South Wales, and, uh, and now, of course, she's a distinguished academic professor of constitutional law at the University of Sydney. And I think her experience in all of those different arms of government, and, and she has the full set, she's done the parliament, the executive and the courts, gives her quite a unique perspective on the topic she's going to talk about today. And uh, it has engendered in her an interest in the intersections between the different arms of government. Today, she's focusing on the relationship bet between the parliament, the executive, and vice-regal reserve powers. And I'm sure she's going to give us an absolutely fascinating and stimulating lecture. And, um, and we'll all be thinking of Harry. Please welcome Professor Anne Toomey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Harry Evans is an absolute icon of this place. Uh, he, in many ways, was the embodiment of the Senate. Voluble, opinionated, somewhat eccentric, committed, and with a very strong belief in the Senate's transformative role for public good. Harry lived and breathed the Senate, and it's actually hard for me, as an outsider now, to imagine this place without him. He indeed had been here so long and could tell so many stories about its people and, it, and the events here that he was actually a living, although somewhat more entertaining, um, embodiment of the, an addition of Odgers. Harry also had, um, from my recollection anyway, quite a gobsmacking story about 1975 and the dismissal uh, and what he happened to see on that particular day. And I remember as a very young um, officer in the Senate, um, being fascinated by this and thinking, wow, wouldn't that be interesting if that became public? The only problem is I've forgotten what the details of it are. And I've asked Rosemary and she knows of it, but she can't remember it either. And I've been interrogating Harry's family. I'm rather hoping that somebody in the audience can remember exactly what it was. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to tell you another small story. This one Harry committed to writing, so we at least have this 
um, in terms of our memory of Harry, and that is about a wager that he held uh, with another Senate, Senate officer about whether or not the Governor-General would dismiss the Whitlam government. Now, despite the common mythology of today that no one in 1975 anticipated the possibility that a Governor-General would dismiss the government, it seems it was pretty much what everybody, at least in Canberra, was talking about at the time, um, at least after Bob Ellicott's opinion was published. Uh, but the essential problem here was one of supply. If the justification for dismissing the government was its failure to achieve supply, there was no point in replacing the government with another government that had neither the confidence of the lower house nor the capacity to pass supply. Moreover, if the point of the dismissal was to prevent the economic chaos and hardship that would have resulted from the government not being able to pay its bills or to pay its public servants, then to dissolve parliament without supply would actually impose the very outcome you were trying to avoid. Hence, it was critical that supply be passed immediately after the dismissal of the Whitlam government and before the parliament was dissolved. Now, knowing this, Harry, as a young officer of the Senate, took the view that the Governor-General would not dismiss the Prime Minister because of the very high risk of failing to secure the supply. Uh, there were procedural tactics that he knew that the government could have taken in the Senate in order to prevent the passage of supply, or at least delay it, and that would have then forced the focus back onto the lower house where there was a vote of no confidence in the Fraser government, and if Parliament had to keep on sitting because there was no supply, then the Governor-General would have been forced to respond to that vote of no confidence. And the likelihood then would have been that the Whitlam government would have been reinstated and the Governor-General would have been forced to resign. Now, having thought through that scenario, Harry then bet a colleague that Kerr would not dismiss Whitlam. And as you all know, Harry lost. Uh, the question remains, how did Kerr anticipate that Fraser would be able to secure supply once it was known that the Whitlam government was dismissed? How could Kerr possibly have guessed that Whitlam, upon his dismissal, instead of going back to the Senate and the Parliament and telling his colleagues, would go home and eat a steak for lunch? I mean, the odds of that must be infinitesimally small, but yet it actually happened. Perhaps Kerr had read Whitlam better than we believe, um, that despite weeks of speculation about the possibility of the dismissal of the Whitlam government, Whitlam's overwhelming hubris had caused him to give no serious contemplation to the prospect of his own dismissal or how tactically to deal with it. Perhaps Kerr reasoned that Whitlam's contempt for the Senate and belief in the supremacy of the House of Representatives would cause him to focus solely on the House and not realise the crucial role of the Senate. Now, if that was Sir John Kerr's reasoning, he was surprisingly prescient, but even then engaged in an extremely high risk enterprise. It could so easily have failed and ended up with Whitlam being reinstated and Kerr being forced to resign or indeed dismissed. Harry Evans concluded in his writings, and I agree, that it was most likely that neither Kerr nor Whitlam had fully thought through the parliamentary aspects of how this would work in conjunction with the exercise of the reserve powers. That's why in this Harry Evans lecture, I thought it was timely to explore that interaction between parliament and the exercise of the reserve powers. And it's also particularly relevant in this parliament where we have a government with a very slim majority in the House of Representatives. By doing a little bit of the anticipatory wargaming, it may avert circumstances where the exercise of the reserve powers might be contemplated. Now, the other important observation I want to make is that back in 1975, we actually had a fairly unsophisticated view of the reserve powers, uh, at least to the, to the extent that anyone had a view about them at all. Uh, and we did so by simply putting certain powers into a box and saying they were reserve powers and other powers weren't in that box, they weren't reserve powers. And in order to work out whether or not you could exercise them or not, all you could rely on were these extremely irregular um, and unsatisfactory precedents.
Now, after thinking about this for a lot over the last few years, I'd instead argue that we should avoid putting the reserve powers in boxes and instead focus upon the constitutional principles that they are supposed to reinforce. So looking at the principles behind the reserve powers and using that as a guide to whether a power should be exercised and the circumstances in which you should do so. Now, given the tight numbers in the current House of Representatives, what are the constitutional ramifications if a vote of no confidence in the Turnbull government is passed by the House of Representatives simply due to the absence of government members, be it because they skipped off early on a Friday or uh, because the pairing system has broken down or because government members are otherwise absent due to illness or other reasons? Would the government have to resign in those circumstances? Could the government advise a dissolution in those circumstances? And how should the Governor General respond? The general principle of responsible government is that a government defeated in the lower house must either resign or advise a dissolution. And if it proceeds to govern without the confidence of the lower house, then the Governor General is entitled to exercise a reserve power to dismiss it. However, there is an exception where the loss of confidence appears to be temporary only. In such circumstances, the Governor General should give the government a reasonable time to establish the restoration of confidence on the floor of the House by way of a vote of confidence in the government. Now, this view was put by Sir John Madden when he was Chief Justice and Lieutenant Governor of Victoria, and it was in relation to a constitutional crisis he was dealing with as Lieutenant Governor. And this is what he said. The Governor does not, of course, use his authority to dismiss his ministers, except in a case where they have really and permanently lost the confidence of the House, but persist nonetheless to retain their offices in a case where they have only technically and temporarily lost the confidence, uh, lost their majority, the governor would, I venture to think, always await the premier's resignation if he saw fit to tender it, or would treat the vote carried against him as something unreal and accidental. Now, there have been occasions, however, where an accidental loss of confidence has brought down a government. A classic case of that is known as the King-Bing Affair from Canada in 1926. Now, in 1925, King's Liberal government lost its majority at an election, but it continued to govern as a minority government with the support of the progressives. After a scandal involving the Customs Department and with a censure, of, um, a censure motion pending against him, Prime Minister King sought a dissolution from the Governor-General, Lord Bing. Now, Bing refused to give him the dissolution because the previous election had only been held eight months before. And there's a general principle, you don't try and hold elections too quickly after each other. So King then resigned and the Governor General appointed the Conservative leader, Arthur Meehan, as Prime Minister. Now, at that time, Meehan did, in fact, hold the support of the progressives and therefore was able to form a government and indeed did survive um, a number of votes on confidence issues. But his government fell by one vote when a pairing arrangement was broken. Now, the member who breached the pairing arrangement claimed that he had dozed off in the chamber and voted by accident <laughs> before realising that he had been paired. It's probably a story we've all heard before. Anyway, um, Mann could have argued that this was simply a technical defeat and sought to carry on but instead he requested a dissolution. And this was because he actually wanted a dissolution. He didn't want it to carry on as a minority government requiring the support, the precarious support of these progressives. The Governor General, with no one left who could form a government, uh, granted the dissolution to Mian, which caused a huge controversy, which I'll come back to. Now, if an accidental defeat on confidence occurred in relation to the Turnbull government, just four months after the double dissolution election, which was held on 2nd of July, and the Prime Minister requested the Governor-General to dissolve the Parliament, should the Governor-General do so? 
Now, while for the most part, viceregal representatives tend to grant dissolutions as and when requested to do so by their responsible advisers, they do have a well-recognised reserve power uh, to refuse to do so. It's commonly accepted that one ground upon which a Governor-General may refuse a request for a dissolution is that it is too soon after the previous election. Here, the principle of representative government applies. The vote of the people should be respected and the elected parliament given a reasonable time, uh, a reasonable opportunity in which to function. It's also recognised that frequent elections are costly, cause disruption for the community and will not necessarily give rise to a different result. The voters should not be required to keep going back to the polling booths until they, quote, get it right, unquote, according to the view of the Prime Minister. So how long after an election is a sufficient period before a new election can justifiably be called? The Canadian Governor-General, uh, a much later one I might add, Adrian Clark, when faced with a minority go federal government in 2004, took the view that it would be irresponsible to agree to holding an election within six months of the previous one, but she said after six months she would probably grant a request. Looking across the various precedents, and there are a few, it's the first six to nine months of a term of a parliament that is the period in which dissolution is most likely to be refused. If, however, there is no one else who can form a government, then the Prime Minister has the Governor-General over a barrel. If, as in the case of the King Bing affair, the Turnbull government were to be refused a dissolution upon suffering an accidental defeat on confidence, and it resigned, then it would be unlikely that in the present parliament, the opposition could form a government, particularly once the coalition's numbers were restored after whatever the accident um, had occurred was resolved. So in those cases, if your opposition cannot form a government to govern, um, it's extremely unlikely that the governor general would um, appoint them to form a government. Um, to appoint the opposition leader as Prime Minister and then grant him an election would of course be inappropriate as Lord Bing discovered in 1926, with the better course being the restoration of the former government and the grant of a dissolution to it. So on this basis, in the face of an accidental defeat in Parliament, even though a request by the Prime Minister for a fresh election at this stage in the game would be unconscionably early, the Governor-General would most likely grant it. Unless, of course, he could use his powers to advise and warn and encourage to persuade the Prime Minister to carry on without um, an election. Uh, this would be because it would be unlikely that there would be any other government that could be formed in the current parliament that would be able to maintain the confidence of the House. Now, another possible scenario is that the current government could lose its majority in the lower house due to the death, resignation, or dare I now say it, disqualification of two or more of its members. Now, what can be done in those circumstances to fend off defeat in the House pending the by-elections which the government may have a good chance of winning? Now, the common course here is for a Prime Minister to advise the Governor-General to prorogue the Parliament until such time as the by-elections have been held so that any confidence motion can be dealt with by a full complement of members of the House. Does the Governor-General have a reserve power to reject advice to prorogue the Parliament? Now, prorogation itself, if we go back to the old system of looking at boxes, people probably wouldn't have put it in a reserve power box if you were looking 10, 20 years ago. But given recent controversies, the, the one in Canada in 2008, most people, most academics at least, now accept that there are some circumstances in which a Governor-General would be justified to refuse advice to prorogue the Parliament. And this includes cases where a government has lost confidence and is trying to avoid accountability to Parliament. So in form, therefore, a request by the Prime Minister to the Governor-General to prorogue the Parliament to avoid a vote of no confidence pending the holding of the by-elections would fall into the category where prorogation could be denied. However, the key here is again the temporary nature of the loss of confidence. It would be absurdly costly 
and disruptive to change government at the point that a member dies or resigns or is disqualified and then have to restore the previous government once the by-election has been held, particularly if the by-election is in a safe seat. Uh, moreover, the principle of representative government would also support the argument that all places in parliament should be filled before it decides on such a critical issue as um, no confidence in the government. Uh, and this is so as long as the by-election is held as soon as reasonably practicable and the resignation is not simply a tactic being used to avoid a vote of no confidence that's pending in the government. Now, let me give you an, um, an example of where that kind of manipulation has occurred, fortunately not in Australia. Uh, so this occurred in Tuvalu in 2012 to 2013. First of all, there was a six month delay in holding a by-election to fill a seat when the government realised that it had lost the, the majority support in the parliament. And then after that happened, they simply just didn't reconvene parliament so there couldn't be a vote of no confidence in the government. Um, eventually, the Governor-General got fed up um, and in order to break the impasse, the Governor-General used another power, again, not a traditional reserve power, but in this case, arguably an appropriate one, and that was to summon Parliament against the will of the government in order to force the accountability of the government to the Parliament. And you see there the, the principle of responsible government coming into play, making government accountable to the Parliament. Uh, so the Governor-General, forced parliament to sit. Uh, how did the government respond? Well, then the Minister of Health resigned his seat and the Speaker announced that there couldn't be a vote of no confidence because now there was a constituency lacking representation. So the second form of manipulation. Um, the controversy then escalated with the Prime Minister advising the Queen to dismiss the Governor-General because he'd exercised his reserve powers. And then the Governor-General, before hearing anything from Buckingham Palace, decided to dismiss the Prime Minister. Uh, so the classic race to the palace sort of scenario that people fantasise about in 1975 actually did happen in Tuvalu. Um, and what was the result in all of that? Well, the one thing we know from all of this is that the Governor-General always wins. Um, and the reason for that is the Governor-General can dismiss the Prime Minister immediately, whereas the Prime Minister has to go to the Queen and ask her to dismiss the Governor-General, and the palace takes the view that masterly inactivity is the appropriate response in those circumstances because a lot of further consideration needs to be given to the issue by which time it's all resolved politically. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, so, uh, and the other factor that comes into play here is that as soon as the Governor General dismisses the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister ceases to be a responsible minister and therefore their advice to the Queen is just dropped into the bin, okay? Uh, solving all problems. So what happened here in Tuvalu was that the Governor-General again used a reserve power to summon the parliament, uh, and this time it did sit and it voted no confidence in the previous government and a new government was formed and it was all resolved um, on a political basis. Now a somewhat less tumultuous example occurred in Western Australia in 1971. Um, there, the Tonkin Labor government lost its majority when the Speaker died. Um, it sought the prorogation of the House until a by-election was held. Now here, unlike in Tuvalu, there was no unconscionable delay in the holding of the by-election and there was no strategic resignations. The Governor granted the prorogation in the circumstances, especially because it was a safe seat that was concerned, but the Governor did make it clear that he considered that he had a reserve power in relation to this, so it was his own discretion to agree to grant the prorogation. Moreover, the British Foreign Secretary, when asked for his views, observed that the decision of whether or not to prorogue was a matter for the Governor's personal discretion, and the Governor's official secretary told the press that the Governor was not bound to act on advice in such matters. In exercising his discretion to support the Premier's request for the prorogation of Parliament, the Governor took the view that the last election had been held very recently, so a fresh one was not warranted, and that any loss of confidence was temporary in nature until such time as it was resolved by the by-election. Now, a third example um, concerns the mcgowan holman Labor government in New South Wales in 1911. Labor had a slim majority, 
um, which it lost when two of its country Labor members resigned their seats in protest over some um, legislation concerning rural leaseholds. Now, Holman managed to survive an initial vote of censure against him due to another sleeping member who happened to be counted as voting on the side of the chamber upon which he was asleep. Um, and um, so the government survived that first vote, but knowing that it was unable to even secure an adjournment, uh, the governor, uh, the um, Holman raced off to see the Lieutenant Governor, asking him to prorogue Parliament until after the by-elections. Now the Lieutenant Governor, um, Sir William Cullen, who again was uh, Chief Justice, so we actually have a few Chief Justices who have exercised reserve powers, interestingly, uh, the, the, the Chief Justice refused to grant the prorogation. Holman then ca calculated that a tactical resignation of the government would be better than defeat on the floor of the House. And he concluded correctly that the opposition leader would struggle to form a government as he would have to rely upon the vote of independence and that the Lieutenant Governor would not grant the opposition leader a dissolution uh, while there was an undefeated alternative government in the wings, especially as the last general election had only been held eight months ago. So Holman was a great tactician in relation to this. He had all those factors in play and could see how best to manipulate things. Uh, so Holman resigned and his plan succeeded. The opposition leader um, ended up being unable to form a government and the Lieutenant Governor was therefore forced to reinstate Holman and to grant him his prorogation until the by-elections were over. Um, after that, Holman still had a rather traumatic time trying to maintain his majority. He ended up with a majority of one. He lost it when it fell over a staircase and landed, uh, injuring himself. Uh, but his majority survived because he managed to pair the fallen member um, with a member of the opposition with the very apt name of Mr Fell. Then, shortly after that, the um, opposition decided that maybe it's time to get rid of this pairing arrangement. And while the threat to the pairing arrangement um, was mooted, Holman um, made public that what they were planning to do was to wheel the fallen member on his hospital bed into the chamber in order to vote. Um, and given the photo opportunity of the um, injured member on his hospital b bed, and I might add that in New South Wales, the hospital was right next to the parliament, um, the photo opportunity was such that a shame-faced opposition decided not to break pairing arrangements. Uh, anyway, uh, Holman's prorogation experience suggests that if the Turnbull government did lose its majority through the death or disqualification or resignation of two or more of its members, it could reasonably seek the prorogation of the House until such time as the by-elections were held, assuming that this was done without undue delay. While the Governor-General would have, technically, a reserve power to reject such advice, it would be wise for him to accept the advice if there was no real prospect of the opposition being able to form a government that held the confidence of the House prior to those by-elections being held. Now, another question here um, is, if you have a Prime Minister facing imminent defeat within his or her own party, can he or she call an early election against the wishes of ministers and the parliamentary party as a means of imposing discipline upon the parliamentary party and galvanising his or her leadership? Now, Jack Lang tried this in New South Wales when he was Premier in 1927. He asked the governor for a, quote, dissolution in secret, unquote. Now, what he meant was that he wanted to be able to pressure his cabinet colleagues by showing them that he had in his pocket the governor's agreement to hold a dissolution. The governor, however, responded, saying that he would only act publicly and not in secret. He consulted the Chief Justice, as he did in those days. Indeed, it was standard pre-1975 practice to do so. Uh, and the Chief Justice noted that while the prerogative of dissolving the parliament belonged to the governor, he doubted whether it would be wise to exercise it other than in exceptional circumstances against the wishes of a majority of the Executive Council. So the governor therefore insisted that the matter be put to the full Executive Council. Now only Lang and possibly one other minister, although it's disputed, um, voted in favour of dissolution and all the other ministers in the Executive Council voted against it. The governor accepted the view of the majority and did not 
grant a dissolution at that stage. But instead, he encouraged Lang to resign as Premier so that he could then be reappointed with a new ministry that would actually support him. Now, this was done on the condition that Lang would later advise a dissolution as soon as the electoral rolls were prepared. Now, that's a rather unusual approach, and it's fairly unlikely that a vice regal officer today would call for a full meeting of the Executive Council to ask its members to state whether or not they agreed to an election. These days, it tends to be regarded as up to the Prime Minister to decide the date of election, except, of course, if you're in an, um, a jurisdiction that has fixed-term elections. If, however, it was clear that the Prime Minister no longer held the support of a majority of his parliamentary party and was therefore likely no longer to command the confidence of a majority in the House, then the Governor-General might well hesitate before acting upon advice by the Prime Minister to dissolve the Parliament, as the Prime Minister's responsibility to Parliament would be in doubt. Now, when Sir Joe Bajolke peterson lost the support of his parliamentary party in November 1987, the Governor warned him that if he sought to resign and be reappointed, just as Lang had done 50 years before, the Governor might decline to reappoint him. While the Governor was not prepared to dismiss Sir Joe from office in the absence of a vote of no confidence against him on the floor of the House, he might well have hesitated to grant Sir Joe a dissolution if he had advised it. And indeed, the Governor was given a legal opinion prepared at the request of the National Party, which had been wargaming all these potential circumstances. Um, so they'd actually got this advice back in October 1987. Uh, in anticipation of Sir Joe seeking a dissolution of Parliament against the wishes of his ministry. And that opinion contended that the Governor should refuse advice to dissolve Parliament if it was given by the Premier contrary to the wishes of the Executive Council and a majority of the House. If the issue had arisen, however, the delay in, um, delay in dealing with it, so taking the palace's view of um, the longer you sit, the more likely the, it will be resolved politically, would probably have been the preferable course rather than outright refusal. Given the enormous political pressures that were at play in the time, it would have been likely that the matter would have been resolved without the um, governor having to act. Now, another scenario, just keeping an eye on the time here. Another scenario, this time actually raised by one of my students, is what would happen if a private member's bill to, to implement the same-sex marriage, um, uh, sorry, to implement same-sex marriage, passed in the House of Representatives due to one or more Liberals crossing the floor, passed the Senate, and was then presented to the Governor-General for assent. Now, this, according to the scenario of my student, uh, then imagine that national par some National Party members of the coalition demanded that the Prime Minister advise the Governor-General to refuse assent to the bill or face the termination of the coalition agreement, sending the Liberal Party into minority government. Could the Prime Minister rightly tell the National Party members that it would be unconstitutional to advise the Governor-General to refuse assent to the bill? And what would the Governor-General do if he received advice to refuse assent to the bill? Um, as you can see, my students ask very tricky questions. Uh, so this scenario raises the as yet unresolved question of whether the grant of royal assent is a legislative act or an executive act. Is the Governor-General, in giving assent to bills, acting upon ministerial advice as part of the executive, or is the Governor-General acting upon the advice of the two houses as a constituent part of the Parliament? Now, in practice, uh, it's actually the clerks of the Parliament, one of which we have here, um, on behalf of the presiding officers who present the bills to the Governor-General for assent. Apart from a certificate by the Attorney-General, which is legal advice as to whether or not there's a legal impediment to giving assent, there is no ministerial advice actually given to the Governor-General to assent. Assent does not occur in a meeting of the Executive Council, and there's no counter-signature on the document uh, to indicate ministerial responsibility for advice to the Governor-General. So in practice, it appears to be uh, a legislative act rather than an executive act. Now, in terms of judicial authority on the proposition, it seems to be rather inconclusive. There are some references in cases to the Governor-General acting as part of the 
quote, crown in parliament, unquote, when granting royal assent. Uh, but much of the commentary is unfocused or contradictory. For example, there's a 2015 Canadian case uh, in which Justice Rennie stated that royal assent is the final stage in the legislative process and that it's given on behalf of the Queen in Parliament. And then he went on to say this, in granting assent, the Governor General does not exercise an independent discretion. He acts on the advice of the Prime Minister. Assent must be given to a bill that has been passed by both houses of Parliament. To withhold assent would be inconsistent with the principle of responsible government. Now, the problem with that statement is that it's potentially contradictory. If assent cannot be withheld to a bill that has passed both houses, then presumably the Governor General is not bound to act on the advice of a Prime Minister in relation to assent if, for example, the Prime Minister advises the Governor General to refuse assent to a bill that has been passed by both houses. At a more fundamental level, this raises a clash between the principle of representative government and responsible government. Under representative government, the people elect their representatives and it's the votes of the representatives in the parliament that must prevail. Under responsible government, the governor general acts on the advice of his or her ministers who are responsible to parliament for their actions. Where ministers advise the deferral or the refusal of assent, because a serious error in the bill has been identified after its passage but before assent, then these principles can be reconciled because it's likely that a majority of the parliament and certainly at least a majority of the lower house um, where, when the government holds a majority there would also support such a deferral or refusal of assent in order to allow the error to be corrected rather than immediately um, have the bill come into force. So, for example, in 1898, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario refused assent to a bill that contained an error, and the journals of the Legislative Assembly recorded that this was done on ministerial advice, quote, it being understood that the Legislative Assembly also desires such withholding of assent there too. Okay, so in those circumstances, it's fine. However, where the reason for ministers advising the refusal of assent to a bill is that the government was defeated in the lower house on the bill, this brings into play the question of their responsibility and suggests that the principle of representative government should prevail, given that ministers cannot claim to command the confidence of the lower house, at least with respect to this particular bill. Now, the principle of responsible government is a two-way street. While the head of state must act upon the advice of responsible ministers in most cases, ministers must maintain their status as responsible to parliament in order to be entitled to give that advice. The whole reason for um, responsible government is to give primacy to parliament by ensuring executive accountability to it. It would seem illogical, therefore, for the principles of responsible government to be relied upon to override the will of the parliament. Now, this point's been made in the United Kingdom by Nick Barber, uh, and this is what he said. The point of the convention on royal assent is to uphold the primacy of the democratic element of the constitution in, making, uh, in the making of law. But just as it would be undemocratic to allow one person, the monarch, to veto legislation, so too it would be undemocratic to give this power to the Prime Minister. In short, when presented with a bill that has passed through Parliament in a proper manner, the duty of the monarch is to give assent, irrespective of the advice of her ministers. There is no room for discretion. On its best interpretation, this is what the Convention requires. If the monarch were to accept the advice of her prime minister on this issue, she would be acting unconstitutionally. Okay, so that's um, at least a view um, on the issue in the United Kingdom. An example of a government refuse, sorry, a government advising the refusal of royal assent to a bill that was passed without its support arose in New Zealand in 1877. The prime minister, Sir George Grey, advised the governor to refuse royal assent to a land bill. The bill had actually been introduced under a previous government, but had continued its progress under Gray's government and had been amended in a manner contrary to the government's wishes. 
Gray advised the governor, Lord Normanby, to refuse assent. The governor rejected this advice. He noted that ministers were entitled to oppose the bill in parliament, but he couldn't see why they should be able to defeat it at the assent stage if they could not do so in the parliament. After various bits of procedural wrangling between the two, the governor eventually gave assent to the bill against the government's wishes. Um, Sir George Grey then complained to the British Secretary of State for the Colonies, arguing that the governor was constitutionally obliged to act on his advice and had failed to do so. The Secretary of State for the Colonies, however, supported the governor in declining to act upon advice to refuse his assent. Now, this example, of course, is very old. Uh, it's difficult, however, to find a more recent example, because in practice, governments that are defeated in Parliament do not advise the refusal of assent to the relevant bill. Now, this may be because the government's defeat on the bill is regarded as a vote of no confidence, causing the government to fall, or because advising the Governor-General to refuse assent to a bill passed by both houses may be so politically provocative that it would cause a vote of no confidence in the government. A third reason might be because of the uncertainty about whether or not the Governor-General would accept such advice and concern that giving such advice may be regarded as unconstitutional, escalating the sense of political crisis. As the Canadian scholar Andrew Hurd has noted, Cabinet ought not to advise a normative refusal of assent in the first place, and that because it is breaching convention in doing so, its advice ought to be rejected. Finally, if the government's advice is rejected by the Governor-General, there's also a line of argument that in those circumstances the government is obliged to resign, meaning that the giving of such advice would again be a very high-risk manoeuvre. If, therefore, a bill was passed against the wishes of the government, be it a same-sex marriage bill or any other, it would be most unwise to advise the Governor-General to refuse assent to it. Allegations would be made that the government was disrespecting the parliament and acting in breach of constitutional principle, which would build a sense of crisis, which most governments try to avoid. Uh, moreover, the Governor-General may well take the view that he is required to act upon the advice of the Houses rather than a defeated government in such circumstances. The rejection of the government's advice would lead to calls for the government to resign or at least for an election to be held. The reason why there are so few examples of such advice being given is therefore that in most cases it would have potentially dire consequences for the government. Now, an exception may occur, however, where a bill actually breaches the Constitution. Now, this might arise in circumstances where, for example, the bill includes or increases an appropriation and it was introduced in the Senate, contrary to the requirements of Section 53 of the Constitution, or it failed to be supported by a message by the Governor-General recommending the purpose of the appropriation, contrary to Section 56 of the Constitution. Now, here, two further constitutional principles arise, and they are the rule of law and the separation of powers. On the one hand, the rule of law requires the executive and the parliament to obey the constitution. On the other hand, the separation of powers requires that courts, rather than the executive, adjudicate upon constitutional validity. On that basis, if the matter is justiciable, by which I mean it could be decided upon by a court, then the Governor-General should give assent and leave the constitutional validity issue to the court to decide. But if, as in the case of sections 53 and 56 of the Constitution, uh, they are non-justiciable, meaning that no court would go behind and interfere in the internal proceedings of the Parliament, then that leaves the Governor-General as the last person standing who can prevent an unconstitutional bill from becoming law. Should in those circumstances the Governor-General refuse assent to the bill, either with or without the advice of the government? There is no authoritative answer to this question and consideration would be need to be given to the particular circumstances, such as the potential harm that might be involved um, if the bill were to come into force and the likely consequences of its passage. In this case, if the Governor-General refused assent to such a bill, not only would this be consistent uh, with the rule of law, 
but it would also arguably support another aspect of the principle of responsible government, and that is the financial, that financial initiative rests in the hands of the government where the government is responsible to parliament. Now, in the written paper, if anybody gets their hands on it, there's a little bit more about some other fascinating aspects of the Governor-General and assent, but um, at this stage, um, I will wind it up uh, by noting that while it's always the best policy for governments to avoid circumstances in which the application of a reserve power might arise, it's also a useful exercise to think through the possibilities of what might occur and how the powers of the Governor-General and the Parliament might interact. In the end, it's the responsibility of all the constitutional players, parliamentarians, ministers, judges, the Governor-General, all of them, to uphold the same constitutional principles. If everyone is working to the same end, with the same understanding of those principles and how they apply, then crises should be able to be avoided. The better the understanding we have of these constitutional principles and the powers and roles of each of the institutions of government, the less likely we will be to face the constitutional upheavals such as those in 1975. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. That was fabulous. And I, I think Harry would have enjoyed that immensely. And uh, also, I think the, the thought at the end that having the numbers may not be enough sometimes it is well worth thinking about. Very sobering. Now, we've got a little bit of time for questions. And I'd ask anybody who does have a question to come to the microphone in the centre of the room or up in the gallery. And uh, I'll give you the call. And uh, it, it would be it would be nice if we can keep our, our questions and answers sure. nice and tight okay. to make the most of, of, of the, the time. Ernst. I was thinking, what could I uh, put to you which was in the tradition of, of Harry Evans? And my question really relates to what discretion does the Governor-General have if the Prime Minister puts to him that he or her that he wants a dissolution because the gov government has become unworkable because of the role of the Senate. Now, I have a vague recollection that some years ago, I think it was Malcolm Fraser who sought a dissolution on those grounds. Uh, I think St Ninian Stephen initially declined and there was a second letter. I think I probably drafted the second letter, which was more strongly worded and it used the terms that government had become unworkable because of the role of the Senate. How wide do you think, or what is the discretion of the Governor-General in those circumstances, and does it, how, how well does it relate to the formal requirements of, uh, for a, a dissolution? Okay, that's a fantastic question because yesterday I spent my time in the National Archives and the file I was actually reading in the National Archives was precisely that one. So what I was looking at uh, was the 1983 uh, double dissolution election and the advices and the controversy between Malcolm Fraser and Sunini and Stevens. So I've just actually been reading that very letter or those, that series of letters yesterday. Uh, so the first thing to note is that section 57 of the constitution, which is the one that deals with double dissolution elections, is slightly different because it's all set out in detail in the constitution and the High Court has held that the detail of it is justiciable, so it is something where um, a Governor-General, when deciding to, give a, a, to grant a double dissolution, does have to be satisfied that the various um, requirements for the, that trigger the double dissolution have been met. All right, so that's different from your ordinary dissolution. This is much more statutory based and specific. Uh, what was interesting was that Sir Ninian, um, took a tentative view, although not a final view, uh, that he also had to be satisfied that um, not only was there a trigger for a double dissolution, but that there was, um, uh, that he should be satisfied that the parliament had become unworkable. Uh, and so that's the advice that he sent Malcolm Fraser back to, to um, consider and give him. 
Now, Seninian actually said that he was satisfied with that advice. Uh, but in a wonderful file note I was reading yesterday where he explained his thinking on all of this, he said there are two, um, two um, strains of thought on this particular issue. You could either take the view of Sir Samuel Griffith um, when he was Chief Justice back in the early days of Federation saying that um, you did have to be satisfied that Parliament was unworkable. Um, or you could take um, the view of um, H.V. Evatt that um, so long as the conditions were satisfied, that was enough and you had no discretion in relation to this. And in explaining his view, uh, Sir Ninian said, well, I didn't have to make a final decision as to whether to choose Griffith or Evatt because in the circumstances I was satisfied uh, that the Senate had um, made the Parliament unworkable, therefore I didn't have to make that invidious choice. So Sir Ninian left open that question um, and that's a question that remains as to whether or not you have to satisfy the Governor-General of that unworkability point. So we, we don't have any further um, decision on that. Um, but I think it's quite interesting that if you look at Saninian's own record of um, his views on that, um, he gave sort of equal weight to both sides of the argument and decided, as a good judge does, that if I don't have to decide, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> Richard. Yeah, Richard Gilbert. That was an inspiring address, Sam, a great uh, tribute to Harry as well. Uh, my question is a simple one. You referred to justice, justiciability and in relation to the courts not interfering with the internal workings of parliament. If uh, the two senators uh, in dispute uh, have their, their, their roles terminated here, uh, any legislation they passed would similarly, be, would it not be justiciable or is it possible that there was a flawed vote and the courts would interfere? Yep. Uh, again, another really interesting question. Um, I was talking to Rosemary about this a bit earlier. Uh, to the extent that we have any authority on the proposition and there's only one case and it's not, um, it's, it's only a little bit of what lawyers call dicta, so it's not something that decided the case, it's just an observation in the case. But the court took the view that uh, you were a senator until such time as you were found to have vacate, your seat be vacated and therefore any um, voting that you did in the meantime would not be held to be invalid. So the courts would not go back and look at the votes and say, well, you have to take that person out because they were disqualified. Uh, that's also consistent with the English approach, and that is that you can't go behind the parliamentary role. Uh, so as far as they're concerned, you can't go behind the, the list of votes and the, you know, so long as the parliament itself says that the vote has been passed, uh, then the courts there won't look behind it either. Uh, so unless somebody challenged that and the court changed its mind, which of course is always a possibility, but I think a fairly remote one because courts would also appreciate that you could cause absolute chaos by uh, going and doing that if you found that someone had been voting in the parliament for two years, it was, you know, was there invalidly and you had to invalidate everything you know, prior to that. Um, uh, given the catastrophic nature of that kind of a decision, my suspicion is if you did try and overturn it, the courts would not be um, interested in taking that path. So I think I'm reasonably confident that the, um, the courts will not go back and look at uh, laws passed by, with the vote of someone later held to be disqualified. We've got a question up the back first. Yes, go ahead. I'm Heather Nash and I was interested in your survey of situations where perhaps in days gone by state governors have conferred with chief justices because they hold the position of lieutenant governor yes. when the governor isn't able to act. In a sense being a deputy governor for practical purposes and I just raised with me um, the question that there is no such similar arrangement at federal level. True. The Chief Justice is not the Lieutenant Governor and obviously the administrators come in when the Governor General is away. And I wonder if it would be your view that it is still the case that for a Governor to confer with a Chief Justice at state level because of that arrangement would still have a legitimacy that would just not arise at federal level. Yep. Um, Rosemary, you've got a very informed audience here. Fabulous question. Um, fabulous <laughs> questions. Okay. Uh, so you're right that at the state level it is different because the Lieutenant Governor is um, a judicial officer. 
Um, since the trauma of 1975 and the um, many attacks on Sir, Sir Garfield Barwick because of the advice and then later um, in relation to Sir Anthony Mason as well, uh, most judges now take the view that they just won't um, be involved in advising on that either at the state level or at the Commonwealth level simply because of concerns about how that would now fit in with the separation of powers. Now, that is now more justified than it was in 1975 because now um, we have changes in our legal system in relation to um, the separation of powers. We have um, issues to, to get technical, there are there's a whole lot of cases about judges acting as persona designata and what they can and what they can't do and whether it's incompatible with being a judge and all the rest of it. So we have a huge amount of jurisprudence that's happened since 1975 that potentially makes it more dangerous for a judge to advise because the issue may be regarded as justiciable in a way that wasn't the case in 1975. So in answer to your question, although you're right, as a Lieutenant Governor, they do have a closer connection with governors um, as, and they do talk informally, I understand, just as a matter of general principle about these sorts of things. Uh, they also um, disappear very quickly when a crisis is, is um, in play um, and um, try not to advise in relation to those simply because of the, the issues about separation of powers and, and the like. So um, regardless of the federal or the state level, judges in Australia are reluctant to be involved. Interestingly, however, if you contrast with Canada, judges still are involved there in advising on those sorts of things. Um, and at the Commonwealth level, sorry, the federal level in Canada, it is the Chief Justice and the you know judges of the Supreme Court who do fill that role, um, unlike in Australia. So they're much more relaxed about it in Canada and other jurisdictions, but because of our 1975 trauma, um, we're much more um, reluctant to have judges involved these days. I think we've got time for one more question and the bar is quite high. Your turn, sir. <laughs> I want to uh, follow up on the scenario advanced by your student uh, about the passage of uh, private members' legislation against the wishes of a government. Surely that would be prima facie evidence of loss of confidence by parliament in that government, and government should then resign. Has indeed ever been an example of private members' legislation in recent times on a significant issue being passed against wishes of government? Uh, look, I think it has. Um, I think you probably find some examples in the United Kingdom, for example, in their minority government where legislation was passed um, against the wishes of government. Uh, and, and often it's the case, you know, in a hung parliament, you know, amendments and the like can be passed that the government's not terribly thrilled about. Um, there is a distinction between um, votes you lose in the parliament as to whether or not they are votes on matters of confidence and simply, you know, votes that aren't. Now, in the case of my student scenario about a same-sex marriage bill, um, it may well be the case that, you know, some members of the government might take the view that it's a matter of conscience that there should have been a free vote and cross the floor, but it isn't a permanent loss of confidence. It falls into that temporary um, category because for all the rest of the time, they're gonna keep voting with the government, okay? So it's just a, we cross the floor once, it doesn't mean the end of the government because the next time and the time after that and the time after that, we will be voting for the government. Uh, so, um, where it becomes critical, however, is if the government says this is a bill that's an issue of confidence. Um, so, and if we get defeated on this, then we will have to resign. And sometimes that's, that's done as a threat. Um, so, you know, I think Tony Blair said that if he'd lost the vote on the, um, on the, the Gulf War um, uh, vote, then he would have resigned. Um, and we did see when David Cameron lost the, the Brexit, although that was a referendum, not a parliamentary vote, that he did resign. Um, so there, there can be occasions where there are issues of conf um, confidence and the government will fall, but there can be other occasions where in particular circumstances, um, uh, the government itself still has support and can continue to govern, even though the one particular instance of a, of a private member's bill is such that it could be passed. Thank you, Anne. I, I think everyone will agree with me that that was a fabulous lecture, very enjoyable, very enjoyable discussion afterwards and fabulous questions too. I think you've done the old boy proud. Oh, thank you, Rosemary. And I'd like you. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's wonderful to see so many people here and lots of lovely, familiar old faces amongst them too. Thank you very much. All right.